Amen. Good morning. Aren't you glad you're in church today? A lot of places we could be, but you chose the right one. Man, what a good morning it's already been. I hope you're enjoying the day already and the worship time and the praise. Over at our other campus, we had a glorious service over there. I'm not expecting anything less than what we've already started here. Amen? Amen! <laughs> Some of you will wake up in just a minute. We'll, we'll wait here for you a second. When you, when you catch up, say, I'm here. All right, good deal. Okay, we'll start then. We've been in this series entitled Breaking Free as we've... Uh, Going the last five weeks, this is six weeks now, we have about three more messages in this particular series. That's if you listen properly. If you listen real slow, we'll have to take a little longer. But this has been a series of messages that has to do with us walking in spiritual freedom. Us experiencing the life of, of liberty and victory that God has intended for us. Too many people are singing about victory in Jesus and so few are actually experiencing victory in Jesus. And God's will and God's desire for us all is to experience the life that Christ died to give us. And all too often, I think we fall way short of what was intended in the plan of God in our redemption. There is a peace that passes all understanding. And far too often, too many Christians don't experience that. There is a joy that really is full of glory. And all too often, too few Christians experience that. So hopefully as we're working our way through this message and, and to this series of messages, uh, desires that you're walking into freedom and discovering it more and more on, on each level of your life. And the messages are set up like that. So it kind of takes us from one place to another as we learn the truth of who we are in Christ. We learn the truth of what God's given us in the, in the context of our authority as a believer, as our, in the context of our power. And not only we have the, the right, to be victorious in Christ. We also have the might. We have what we need. It's not, not only have we been called to live a life, we, we've been equipped to live that life. And so as we go through all this, let's get down to some nitty gritty, amen, today when we talk about the actual conflict that we deal with in our, our spiritual life the, and the forces of hell that literally do try to enslave us and keep us in captivity. If you're living kind of outside the realm of understanding that there is a spiritual battle and that there really is a spiritual war, and if, if you just kind of don't give any conscious mindset to that, uh, that there's an enemy or that, that there are principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness, as the Bible calls it, in high places, then it's easily brought into a place of blindness and, in reality, spiritual captivity. So I want to talk about, you know, just uh, the, the subtitle is called Having It Your Way. No, we didn't steal that from Burger King. They stole it from the devil, yeah. literally. <laughs> Having it your own way. All too often, that's the, that's the bottom line. We want to do it our way. We want to do our life our way, our job our way, our church our way, just whatever I want. That's, that seems to be the, the, the ruling influence in our life. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, and just how Satan works using that mindset against us to keep us in captivity. So let's, let's look at the lesson today. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Remember when, when in, in the garden, maybe you weren't there personally, I, I may be old enough to be in there, but, but I wasn't. When Adam forfeited his position of authority, remember God had given him authority in the garden over the planet, placed him in the garden of Eden with authority, with right, with might, that he forfeited that right and he forfeited that might to the enemy. And although he was alive spiritually, at the point of his disobedience to God, he dies spiritually, as the scripture said he would, as the warning came. He dies spiritually at that point and doesn't experience uh, the life that God had intended for him to experience. But even worse than that, he hands the keys over to the enemy. And Satan now becomes the God of this world. And that's a little G we know because God is ruler over all things and there's none before him, there's none after him. He is God, God, God. But even Jesus, in, in making reference to the enemy, you, you have to hit these subtitles for me because apparently it's going to skip it today. So go back to that other one. If we can get to it, if not, don't worry about it. John 12, 31, Jesus is speaking of the devil and he says, now the prince of this world is judged. You know, the prince of this world is, is judged and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. In John 14, 30, he says, hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. Again, in John 16, He's talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit when he comes. 
that he would convince the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Why? Because the prince of this world is judged. So he's making reference to the enemy, to, to Satan himself, and he's calling him a, a prince. He has some ruling authority, he has ruling power that's been given to him because it was forfeited by Adam. But as you follow the scriptures on through, you know, it tells us that at the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, at that point, Jesus comes back out of the grave and he says, listen, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. All authority. Now, who reigns as supreme king of kings, lord of lords, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow? He's the king. He's the lord. All right. He is in charge now. And the beautiful thing is we've shared is we talked last week about our spiritual warfare and our spiritual wardrobe and the weapons of our warfare that God has given us the right over the enemy. He's no longer our prince. He's not our little G. All right? We have one God and one God only. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We serve Christ. And now we don't have to serve the enemy because God has done a work in us. Simply put, here's the way it works. You get saved, you give your life to Christ. It's the will of God for you to grow in grace, right? It's for the will of God for you to mature in Christ, not to stay stagnant, but to be moving forward, to be advancing in your spiritual walk and in your spiritual life, experiencing victory on a daily basis and growing. All too often, that's not the truth. That's not the way it works out. I, I love an illustration that uh, Dr. Anderson gives in his book, the, book the, the Bondage Breaker. He said it's like this in, in, in regard to your, the spiritual battle in your life. He said, your life is kind of like a long street. The goal is becoming more and more like Christ. He said, although Christ is with us, but let's use this for illustration's sake. He's at the end of the street and you're at this end of the street. Now, this long street that you're on is surrounded by tall buildings on both sides. You have one goal, that's to move towards Christ. You have one goal, to grow in grace. You have one goal, to become more and more intimately acquainted with the Lord who's out in front of you. To move closer and closer in your intimate relationship of faith with Him. That's the goal. But here's the way Satan works. He's like the guy on the street corner. Look at this, pay attention to this. Out of the little windows hang little demons. Out the side streets and corners under the lights hang little demons. And they're all up and down the street saying, hey, look over here. Hey, watch this. Hey, you, want the, you ought to try this. It's real, everybody's doing this. Come over here. Or they're shouting from the windows. Oh, you're, you're, you're worthless. You're a bum. Oh, you call yourself a Christian. So all this stuff's going on on the side streets, right? What are you supposed to do? Last thing you need to do is take up a debate with the enemy. You need to keep moving forward with your eyes fixed on Christ, surrendering to his will and subjecting yourself to his grace, not listening to all those things that are going on. Now, those things that you hear from the side streets, like you're ugly, you're stupid, you'll never make it, all those things that seek to, to distract you, try this, nothing wrong with it, everybody else is doing it. You know, all that that's going on, many times you don't even hear it as maybe as a voice. Maybe it, it's, 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 Satan's really good at this. He likes using the first person singular, like, I'm no good. I ought to try that. I think I'll do that. I, and those, those thoughts come in in that way as well. But the problem is you listen instead of moving forward. You look away instead of looking forward. You know, you embrace something along the side. You get distracted by what's going on. You, you hear the voice. You hear the, the call, the accusation, the temptation. And you end up not moving forward, but you end up in captivity instead of moving forward to what God wants you to be. Let me just talk about levels of bondage here. Uh, we, like, a lot of times we look in Scripture and we see these guys that are just fully possessed of demons, you know, like the, the demoniac of the Gadarenes, you know, and he's screaming out and he's, he's, you know, he's been cutting himself and he's bleeding and he's cutting himself with stones and they've tried to help him and he can't be bound with chains. He's, he's running buck naked through the cemeteries, you know. They, this guy's just completely out of control. Let me put it this way. Nobody gets there overnight, but there are some people who get all the way there. But it doesn't happen overnight. Satan just wants to get a little bit of our life. All right? And if he can get a little bit, guess what he gets? He can get a little more. It's kind of like the old vacuum cleaner salesman. If I can just get my foot in the door and give an illustration, you know, a free test, then, then I've got you. And I keep you in bondage. But there are levels, I think, that we, we do see in people who are struggling. You know, as Paul, even in Scripture, talks about battling with, you know, forces of wickedness in high places. Uh, the truth of the matter is, most Christians are struggling 
majority probably, and not living where God wants them to live when it's, when it's fully available to them. They're just not, they're not there. There's three levels we'll look at. You, if you'll click those down for me, if they'll, they'll come up. Like first is the believer, the believer who lives a, lives a normal life outwardly. You know, he wrestles with a, a steady barrage of temptation, and, and all too often he gives in to these things, whether it's lust or greed or hatred or apathy. You know, prayer for the most part is frustrating and, and difficult. It's a frustrating experience. When it comes down to having a, a quiet time, a, a devotional life, they, they probably don't have much of one at all. They always, it seems to be struggling with relationships, you know, getting along with people and, you know, the influence of, of, of personality conflicts is a constant barrage. And they most, 99% of the time, don't realize how much of what they're involved in is really a spiritual conflict, you know. You know, they wouldn't identify like hearing voices coming to them, but man, they are peppered with fiery darts constantly and not really even responding to them. Most of the problems go in their life. They, oh, it's all my fault. I'm no good. I'd never, I'll never be anything for God. And, you know, and most of the time they end up in some cycle of self-condemnation, not, not really experiencing what God has for them. So, you know, Pastor, how, how much of the church do you think is there? I, I think in the average church, probably 65, 70% of the people are there. Does that sound a little shocking? It shouldn't. You know, that, that's, that, that's, that's a majority. The second level is, is those people who are characterized... By, by those voices or things, they can distinguish between their own thoughts and maybe some strange evil voice or thoughts that seem to be overpowering them. And they will kind of sit back in alarm of wondering, you know, when these things begin to barrage their minds with sinful ideas and thoughts and they experience no victory. You know, and they wonder if they're cracking up. They fail to see the struggle, though, in the arena that it really is, that it is a spiritual battle and that they are being under assault by spiritual forces. Sometimes they seek counseling. Sometimes they just struggle through it and try to discipline their thoughts. Many times this particular group of people live with a lot of anxieties, depression, uh, you know, paranoia, and bitterness, anger. A lot of times they fall victim to things to kind of anesthetize the problem like drugs or alcohol, eating disorders. And about 15%, I would say, the church falls into that particular category. That's where they're at in their spiritual life. The third level is, is those people who, I mean, this point, they've, they're kind of like that guy in, in Mark chapter 5, the maniac, the demoniac of the Gadarenes, lo absolutely lost all control, hearing voices inside them tell them what to say, voices telling them what to do, and they respond to it. These people kind of either end up staying at home, hiding, or wandering the streets talking to imaginary friends, you know, because they've just lost it, and they're completely, you know, they occupy mental hospitals, little or no answers available to them. And I would say there's probably 5% of, of the Christian world today might fall into that category. They've just given in to these inner voices, and it's like it's a little bit more, and then it's a little bit more, and a little bit more, until they just, they're oppressed completely by demonic forces. You say, well, how, how do you respond to that? I mean, as a Christian, praise God, I, I'm not there, but I don't want to be there. I, I, I want to I move forward. And so part of this message and the bulk of this message deals with just dealing with temptations. You know, and those things that come, how do we deal with those things? Now, there's three ways I want to bring up to you the way people deal with these things. Two of them are wrong, and one of them is right, all right? The first one is this. There's those people that, the, the most defeated are those who hear demonic thoughts and believe them. That's the last thing to do. Whatever Satan seems to say to them, they can't distinguish that it is a satanic thing or a spiritual thing. And, you know, the, the thought is shot to the mind. Uh, you don't need to pray today. Where do you think that comes from? Oh, don't read the Bible. You ain't got time to read the Bible. You know? and, they go, oh, and they say, oh, I don't have time to pray. And the devil says, don't share Christ. There. Oh, I don't have time to share Christ. You know, and without any distinguishing or any discernment, they just fall right into that little ready trap. And, and they start thinking about their failures. And, you know, at this point, Satan said, well, you're not very lovable to God. He says stuff like that. And, you know, they just, you know, believe that God's love is conditional when in reality it isn't conditional. God's love is not based on me meriting it, is it? It's based on the grace of God. And they just kind of end up in their spiritual life because they're just hearing things and thinking it's their thoughts or whatever and believing those things and they set up in the road going nowhere. They've been duped into believing that's just the best that there really is and they'll never be victorious. They're just kind of a helpless victim. And there's no reason why that individual cannot get up and start heading down the road towards Jesus to be what God's called them to be. The second is this. You would try to argue with the demons. I am not. I'm not stupid. I'm not ugly. 
I'm not defeating it. They just kind of go into all these things. But the problem is that the, their thoughts are still being controlled. The agenda has been set and they stand in the middle of the street, this, this proverbial street where we're supposed to be walking with God down. And all these things are coming at them from both sides of the street and Satan's doing, doing his best to distract them. And they just kind of sit in their spiritual life going nowhere. You know, they, they know that there's a walk with God. They, they know there's a relationship to be experienced that's intimate. They've heard the truth, but yet it's just, it's not affecting their lives yet. And so, you know, they just kind of arguing with it. I don't need to do that. And it's back and forth. But that's not the position we take in spiritual battle either or in dealing with thoughts that are contrary to the will of God in our life. The, the third is what I think is the most important. Well, excuse me, I messed that up since you helped me out there. The third is that we just ignore it. All right. This is the proper route. And it's not in ignoring perhaps it, the saying I, I don't believe they exist. It's knowing how to deal with it. All right. It's ignoring those voices on the street that we're talking about. Remember, life is here. Jesus before us, our calls to walk with him. But instead, all around us are all these thoughts and temptations hitting us from both sides. What am I going to do? I'm not going to pay attention to them anymore. I'm not going to give them a second thought. You got it? Are you with me? I, I'm not going to negotiate. The only way I'm going to meet the lies or the accusation or the condemnation of Satan is not with my willpower, my wit, and my, my ability to outspink the devil. I'm just going, to, just going to hold up truth. I'm going to believe what the Bible says. I'm going to believe what God says. And I'm not going to give in and subject myself to, to you know, just kind of standing there and, you know, giving in to these things. Remember, if you're a child of God, what, what have we said? If you're walking in the Spirit... If you're daily putting on the armor of God as God's told you to do, then it is very clear and, and understandable that victory is yours. This is where 1 John says to us, Little children, you are of God, and the wicked one cannot touch you. Amen. All right? I don't have to let him manipulate me either. All right? So when the arrows of temptation, when the accusations, when the condemnation when the deception begins to fly like the fiery darts, I raise my shield, as we talked about in our spiritual armor lesson last week. I deflect the attack. I walk in the fact that I'm complete in Jesus Christ. I don't need something from the outside to fill my life up. I begin, as we said last week, to take every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ Jesus. And I begin to discover now that I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on Christ. I'm not focusing on all these little distractions. I began to realize that my thoughts can come into obedience of Christ. And I began to yield. Now understand this as we walk down this street that we've laid out here, walking to Christ and walking with Christ and walking in Christ, it doesn't mean that the distractions stop. And it does not mean that the temptation stops. Some people think they've arrived, they're spiritual, and they're beyond it. Boy, the Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. So it doesn't stop. I, I saw this quote the other day from J. Oswald Sanders, which is a great quote where he says this, talking about Satan's power. Lest we be terrified by our adversaries, it is well to remember that Satan's power is not inherent but permitted. It is not unlimited but controlled. It is not invincible but broken. It is not assured of success but is surely doomed. Satan knows well there is no ultimate victory for him. Can I get an amen? amen? The pronounced sentence has only been postponed. But he works to hinder and postpone Christ's final triumph. We can rejoice in the certainty of John's assurance. What is that assurance? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. What a great promise. Now all the temptations, we say, as we, we imagine the street that we're walking, all the enticement, you know, it's that, it's that mindset of what we said was the subtitle to our sermon. Enticed to have it our way. You know, that, that didn't come up again with Burger King. Have it your way. Hold the pickles, pickles lettuce, whatever it is. You know. Everybody gets tempted. And usually the source come, is from the enemy. And he has channels that we'll talk about. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But it all comes down to this. You know, it's, it's, it's the temptations come. We get bombarded with things that are contrary to God's will. And to God's desires for our life. You know, and here's where you have to be careful. Never equate temptation with sin. Because you can be tempted and not sin. But if you're guilty just for being tempted, Satan's winning a battle already. You're going to be tempted. You're going to think things that are contrary to the will of God. You're going to think thoughts that are ungodly. Junk's going to come in. 
It's, it comes in and Satan brings it very carefully and cunningly into your mind. But remember this. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 4 verse 15 that he was tempted but yet without sin. All right? So it, it's not sin to be tempted. We're going to be tempted. The idea now is to overcome and have success. So let me dig a little definition or maybe describe temptation so we easily recognize it because all too often I think that Satan is so good at this we don't even recognize what's going on. And when we don't, we're certainly going to yield to it. But if we begin to recognize it up front and we understand it, well, then we can quickly refuse the invitation to have it our own way, which is usually not our own way anyway. Let's look at the basis of temptation and kind of walk through it. You know, since, as we said earlier and, and said through the whole series, since Adam, every person that's been born alive is born dead, all right? We're spiritually dead. Ephesians says we're, we're, we're dead in our trespass and sin, but he, God makes us alive in Christ Jesus. Now catch this. I got saved when I was 21. Some of you got saved later, some of you got er saved earlier. But the idea is here, uh, I, I, the first point here is having no relationship with God, you know, in my life, I just progressed through some very important developmental years of my life, choosing and learning how to live independent of God, which is the goal of Satan. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to live dependent upon the Lord. I attempted like everybody else, to get my needs met or your needs met apart from God. And we, be, we just grow up because of our fallen nature. We just begin to develop patterns of thoughts and our behavior and, uh, that's centered on our own interest. This is what I want. This, this is what I like. This is, this is what I desire. And so as you look at what temptation is, we all have desires. In fact, most of our desires are legitimate desires. We've talked about before that temptation is Satan seeking to get you to satisfy a legitimate, God-given drive in a God-forbidden manner, contrary to the will of God, independent of God. And that's the goal. So the source of entitlement is to have these legitimate human needs met through the, re the resources other than God. What are those channels? Uh, uh, this the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right? And when I seek to satisfy my needs through the world or my flesh or through, the sa through Satan, then what have I done? I've been tempted to live my life independent of God. In Philippians 4.19, which is, is quoted by a lot of people, but not understood by a lot of people, where the apostle says, and my God shall supply all my need according, you know, to his treasures and by, through Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus will supply all my needs. Temptation is Satan getting me to satisfy my needs apart from Christ, or apart from Christ's will, or apart from Christ's way and what God wants. So the power of the temptation in my life or your life, a lot of times the power of that particular temptation depends on the strength of the strongholds that you've been developing in your life or your mind when you lived your life apart from the will of God. Put it this way. If you lived in a home where TV programs of questionable nature were allowed or playboys were laid out on the countertops, you know, the power of sexual temptation is probably going to be greater for you than perhaps maybe it is for somebody else. Maybe you had permissive parents who really just didn't make a lot of, have a lot of standards or a lot of rules for whatever reason, you know, you, you become an easier prey for, for these needs in your life to be met outside the way God designed them to be met. And we miss God's will and we miss God's purposes here. So it's important as parents, we provide protection for our children, amen, put them in an environment and where we fail that seek to minister to them in the future over it, but to be what God's called us to be as parents in a protective nature. But if somebody has less of that in their life, then they're going to be prone to some more temptations perhaps than you are. Or you start toying in these different areas, listening to what Satan has to say in these areas, and you begin to open up areas of your life, and again, you progressively move away from the will of God. One of the big things that Satan likes to do well, hit click number three there. Basically, we develop patterns of thought and behavior which are just centered ultimately on our own interest. You know, it's what I want. And the very, a very clever and unique way that Satan likes to do this is, is kind of like too much of a good thing. We're tempted to take the things that God created beyond the boundaries. You know, we just, we take them beyond what, you know, it, what God desires. Satan has this little tactic is to push us to, to something good beyond the boundary of the will of God until it literally becomes sin. It's like the proverbial frog in the kettle. You know, you've heard the, the illustration, you take a frog, throw him in the boiling water, he's going to jump out immediately. 
But if you put a frog in just the lukewarm water and you begin to heat it slowly, he'll die in that boiling water. And so most of Satan's tactics are just to slowly push us out of the will of God, get preoccupied with the world or our flesh or, you know, the, just any, any area he can get us preoccupied with other than God. It, it's like stepping into the dark room. You know, you, you've been to the restaurants at, at, in the bright sunshine outside and you step into a restaurant and it's real dark, you know. And usually the maitre d' or the waiter will say something, well, I'll seat you at your table, but be careful. It's dark in here. Watch your step. But not to worry. You'll get used to it. <laughs> That's exactly what Satan likes to do. Let me bring you out of the light. Don't worry. You'll get used to the dark. But the light exposes everything. So that's why we walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, the Apostle Paul said this, and this is where some of you may be getting beat up at. The Apostle Paul said, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, I'm under grace now. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And all things are lawful for me. But it would be ignorant on my part to pursue all things. He said, not all things are profitable. <laughs> not all things are good. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. I love why he said, I'm not going to be mastered by anything, but he's made the mark over the, he's going to be mastered by someone, and that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what happens is sometimes we just get irresponsible in, in perhaps good and lawful directions and eventually end, run the red light on God's will. You say, well, how's that work? Well, it works like this. I need physical rest. What do you like? But what happens? We get preoccupied with our physical rest, and that soon becomes laziness. Perhaps it's maybe, you know, we, we say, I just need quietness, and quietness soon becomes non-communication. It could well be that God's given you a unique ability in the business world, and you have this ability to make wealth, all right? And, uh, that ability to profit becomes ultimately greed, selfishness, avarice. Self-respect becomes conceited. I have a lot. Let me just read a few of these. And physical pleasure can become sensuality. Enjoyment of food becomes gluttony. Self-care becomes selfishness. Self-respect becomes conceit. Communication becomes Gossip, cautiousness becomes, we ought to be cautious, right? Becomes unbelief. Anger becomes rage and bad temper. Loving kindness becomes overprotection. Judgment becomes criticism. Same-sex friendships become homosexuality. Freedom beco becomes immorality. Generosity becomes wastefulness. Carefulness becomes fear. And on and on that list could go. The idea is sometimes we're, 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 we're deceived in, in these areas that we say, well, this is good, what's wrong with this? And we're pushed across the line. Remember, let's go back to that first illustration. The goal in our life is to, is to walk with God. Here we're on the street, tall buildings every side of us, hanging out these windows and down the alleys and side streets are these voices. Have it your way, do this, see this, watch this, look at this. All these things to distract us from the most important thing in the road, and that's Jesus. We're walking with him. We're walking face to face. We're walking in a relationship of intimacy, and Satan does not want you to do that because the more you walk that direction focused on Christ, the deeper your life becomes, the stronger you become, the more mature your life becomes. Remember the problem at the church of Corinth was Paul talking to the Corinthians about their immaturity. He said, you've had time to grow. You ought to be teachers. But here you are, you're still babes in Christ. I'd love to feed you with meat, but I can't. I still have to feed you with milk because they weren't growing. They weren't maturing. They weren't going farther. There's a passage we'll kind of wrap the rest of the message around here in 1 John. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you've known the father. I've written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Now, I do not really believe, and most people who study scriptures don't believe he's talking to the little children and the young men and the men. He's talking about spiritually little children, spiritually young men, and spiritually mature people. The first level is compared to little children. He says, your sins are forgiven. You're possessing a knowledge of God. God you call God your father. In other words, you're in, you're in the family. You're part of God. You have overcome the penalty of sin against you because you've received the grace of God. You haven't grown to maturity. The second level he mentions several times is young men, verses 13 and 14. He said, you have overcome the evil one. 
That means they're not still in battles, not maybe lose a battle occasionally, but aggressively they're growing stronger. They are in the Word, the Word's in them. They know the truth of God's Word. They've begun to learn how to use it in their life. They're not in bondage to a bunch of controlling habitual sins and things in their life. They're learning how to have personal relationships without conflict. They're learning scriptural principles, how to deal with issues in their life, and they're young men. And then he talks about the third level being fathers. They've developed this, you've known him from the beginning. Others, they, they have a deeper relationship. There's a deeper intimacy, a deeper personal knowledge of God. Developed through time and commitment. They have this faith that's firmly rooted in the word of God and expresses itself with an intimacy with the heavenly father. Now those are three categories that we highlight in this passage. Children, young men, fathers. Now, I'm not going to label you, but I would ask you to label yourself. All right, where are you? Would you say, well, you know, I, I know my sins are forgiven, and, but I am not overcoming. Or I'm, I, I could identify myself as that younger person who's experiencing victory in the battles and, and, and moving forward and conquering the different areas of my life. Or right, there's, there's the place in my life, and again, as fathers, doesn't mean they're, they're sinless. All right, doesn't mean they've reached perfection because we not do that till we meet Jesus, amen? So we don't hold people up to that standard. It's, it's, they're, 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 they're going deeper with God every day. Now, the channels, th those are kind of the levels of maturity he talks about. Now, this, is, this has to be taken in context of the scriptures because the next verse he starts talking about your love, this intimacy you have with God. You know, you can't love God and love the world. And well, let me just share it with you, these few verses. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the, the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pros for pride of life, that's not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. He talks about what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. Now those three things are the channels by which Satan will tempt us. All right? Those are the avenues which he's, he's not going to come up here himself and wave himself's ugly face in your, in your face. All right? He's, he's subtle, and so he uses, the, he uses the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, and, and the boastful pride of life. Now, let's look at each one of those just briefly. The lust of the flesh. This, this has to do with what well, we might call them animal cravings. I just call them the, the desires, really, the passions, the appetites that we all have. Now, they're legitimate appetites, are they not? I mean, I have a desire uh, to eat. That God gave me a hunger drive. There's all kinds of drives and desires in my life. The issue is, will I satisfy those properly? Or will I satisfy them the way I want to? You remember in the garden, in Genesis chapter 3, during this whole conflict, this was Satan's first attack. Remember it says that, that Eve saw this fruit and she saw that it was good for food. There's this natural appeal. But catch this, and, and click that next one. The, the goal of Satan here is to, is to draw, well it didn't go, did it? The goal of Satan here is to draw us, first of all, away from, catch this, the will of God. The second goal here is to destroy our dependence upon God. I want my needs to be met legitimately by whatever God has for me, not by what the world offers me, my flesh offers me. The first Adam, the appeal was to this. Has God said you shall not eat from the tree of the garden? That's the, but listen how the second Adam, Jesus, responds to this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan's approach to Eve, he plants this doubt in her mind about the fruit of the tree. Eve answers, well, God said you shouldn't eat that. Satan begins to pique her appetite for what's forbidden. She saw the tree was good for food at this point, and the enticement to meet a legitimate need is now there, but it's apart from what God wants. It's outside the boundaries of what God desired. God had said, you know, Adam, every tree in this vast, beautiful garden Every kind of fruit-bearing tree imaginable was there is yours. What this one? And what do we do? We focus on the one instead of the multitude of blessings that God's given us. We focus on the thing that we want to have it our way. The lust of our eyes. We saw it. We want it. And Satan begins to win a victory. The second one here is the lust of the eyes. Selfishness, self-interest. Look at things through my eyes. It says, she looked at it and it was a delight to the eyes. Again, what's Satan seeking to do? He wants to draw us away from the word of God. 
What does God want? My, he wants to destroy our confidence in God. First Adam is told, oh, take it, you shall not die. You surely you'll not die. Second Adam responds, in the midst of temptation, in regard to these issues of the lust of the eyes, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. But this is our culture today. It's what you want. You're number one. It's what's best for you. It's what you like. Ah, you know, I know what the Bible says, but God wants you happy. You know, God wants you successful. This is seen really, a lot of this is seen the prosperity doctrines of the church today. You know, they're not based upon the will of God, the word of God, confidence of God. It's on what I can get and how I can get more. And I can have more. You know, listen, if God doesn't want me to have something, I don't want anything to do with it. I remember a great story of this, and some of you remember uh, uh, this person as I bring them up because you were friends with him as well as I was. I had a friend of mine who worked on my cars a lot and worked with our ministry a lot named uh, Jesse Robinson. And Jesse had a wife named Jackie. And Jackie had, came down with a severe illness of cancer. And when I talked to Jackie, she said, you know, pastor, she was evangelist, and she said, Brother Joe, she said, I've spent a long time on the Lord about this issue, and the Lord's told me he's not going to heal me, he's going to take me home, and I'm ready for that. But in the meantime, whether it was at home or in the hospitals, in that process that she went through, there were tons of people came in praying for her healing, telling them, prophesying over her, that God's going to heal you. Yeah. And we know God can heal, we know God does heal. But we know it's not God's will to heal everyone, is it? You know, God's at no, it has, has no obligation to my whim and my wishes. It's not my will, but thy will be done. All right? And she had a word, and she was perfectly at peace when that day came. And she, she stepped right in the presence of Jesus without complaint. You know, ready to meet God. But there was a lot of people disappointed. There were a lot of preachers disappointed. Because they'd gotten a word. Well, God lied, I guess. Or maybe their word wasn't based upon the will of God, but their own desires for the lust of the eyes of what they wanted are, you know. God's not under obligation to us in this regard. He's under obligation to his word and to his will for our lives. And he responds to us, not again on the basis of our whims or our wishes. He responds to us on the basis of thy will, Lord God. What is thy will? Jesus says in John 5, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. Everything about Jesus said, not my will, but thy will, all the way to Gethsemane, all the way to the cross. Nonetheless, not my will, but thy will. The third avenue, channel which Satan comes, is the pride of life. This is self-promotion, self-exaltation, tempted to rule our own way. Satan says to Adam and to Eve, uh, this will make you wise. It's desirable to make one wise. You can be like God. Well, that's a popular theology today as well. You can be like God. Well, folks, you know, it's all right to desire to be like God, but you're not going to be God. And that's where people get warped in their, their understanding of things. They, they want to be God. Contrary to Mormon doctrine, you're not going to be a God, all right? That's not going to happen. God says in Scripture, there's none before me. There will be none after me. The one... The only. God. All right? He's God. We're not. And the idea here is that the pride of life draws us away, first of all, from our worship of God. We, we're not worshiping God. We start worshiping ourselves. You say, I wouldn't do that, but yet our life becomes so self-interested. Are we not worshiping ourselves? If our whole life is about what I get, what I can have, and what I want, have I not missed the mark? It destroys our obedience to God. To the first statement, he says, you shall be like God. To the second Adam in temptation in Matthew, the Lord responds, you shall fear the Lord your God and you shall worship him. We're tempted, whether we're lost or whether we're saved, to direct our own destiny, to rule our own world, to have it our way, to be our own God. And, and you know, he tried the same with Jesus at the pinnacle of the temple. When you feel that you don't need God's help or direction, it's time to repent. When you feel you don't need to hear from God, it's time to repent. My God shall satisfy all my need according to his riches and glory. The three critical areas, the three critical areas are this. One, the will of God in your life. Critical area number one. And that's expressed in my life by dependence upon God. Secondary is the word of God in my life. That's expressed by my confidence in his word. I believe he, he performed it. Third is the worship of God in my life. How's that expressed? Through my obedience to him. That I truly do worship him. And every temptation 
that you experience today, tomorrow, next year, next month, is going to, is going to focus, it's going to challenge one of these three areas. Are you going to do the will of God? Are you going to have confidence in what God says? Or are you going to worship God? And we just need to bring it back down to that. Now, the, the two biggest appetites we face, and I don't have this on a slide or anything, but just to quickly hit this, are, are, are probably the two biggest drives within our human element are food. I like to eat. You know, and the other, sex. Those are two seems to be most compelling things about our physical makeup. But God has a will concerning these things. God has his word concerning these things. And God has his way concerning these, way, these things. And I have to decide now, am I going to have my will? Am I going to eat to live or live to eat? Yeah. Am I going to experience what I want sexually? No matter what God says. Well, I know what the Bible says. But you know, things have changed. Times have changed. People are different. All those excuses. You know, those same excuses that endorse homosexuality. This whole transsexual movement as well. The, sa or the same excuses that the pedophile will use this next generation to come. Or those who will practice bestiality. It's the same excuse. I want what I want. This is the way I am. You're just judging me. That'll be the final word. That's the way it all comes down. In reality is what does the Bible say? The Bible says if you pursue this route, then you sin against God and you sin against your own body. In regard to sexual passion, the Bible says, hey, flee fornication. Pretty simple. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that sins against, that commits fornication sins against his own body. And it seems that this activity or the idea that we just do whatever we want whenever we have we want because that's what I want is why the world drifts further and further away from any moral standard that God ever placed out there for us. Now, let's, let's deal with this as we close. I think this is a good question, the way of escape. I'm going to let you read that just for a minute. Now, I either believe that or I don't. There hath no temptation taken Joe Arms, but just such as common to anybody else. Stop right there, because a lot of people say, you just don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know how I was raised. You don't know what, I can, what happened to me. You, hey, there's no temptation taken you such as common to man. And I'm not, not trying to be unsympathetic in any way. You know, if you need some th sympathy, I'll be glad to, after the service, pat you on the back. All right? But the issue here, I don't need to make excuses. I, I, I don't need to, I need to, to, to learn what? My dependence upon God. My confidence in Him. My love for Him and my worship of Him. So no excuses. Everybody's tempted. All right, it's common to every man. But God is faithful. God's what? God's faithful. So that with every temptation, you say, well, what about that? Yeah. With every temptation, you know what? With every temptation, the scriptures are clear. God is faithful, will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will, with the temptation, make a way to escape that you might be able to bear. Amen. Simply put, let's go back to the street we were on. All these things pulled us from the side. Where's the way of escape? He says, here's the temptation, he'll make a way. With a temptation comes a way, right? With a temptation comes a what? Way. With a temptation comes a, a way. There's a way to go. Temptation is an optional way, the wrong way, not the right way. The way stands in front of you is Jesus. The way, I am the way, the truth, the life. But we're too preoccupied with the distraction. So what we have to do, we have to, we have to meet this thing head on. And, and you say, Pastor, I'm just looking for the escape hatch. <laughs> Where's the escape hatch? Well, go back to that. I blew it too fast. The escape hatch, listen, simply put, is right there. It's the same place the temptation is introduced. It's in your mind. Now you can go to the next verse. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. Where do those take place? In the mind. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, where's the knowledge of God? It's supposed to be expressed in our mind because we have the mind of Christ. So we bring all this stuff in our mind. We bring it into captivity. Every what? Thought. Where's, where are the thoughts? They're in your mind. I bring them to the obedience of Christ. What am I saying? I bring that right to the light. I bring it right to Christ. I bring it. He is the way. It's first introduced in my mind through a temptation, using the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, or whatever it might be. Satan comes in using some channel. At this point, I begin to say, all right, that's a thought in my mind. I'm going to apprehend that thought 
according to this passage, and I'm going to submit it to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what if it, hey, there's an evaluation process maybe that you need to go through. Philippians 4, 8 is a great passage to memorize in Scripture. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. So if it's not lovely, if it's not true, if it's not honest, if it's not just, if it's not pure, if it's, if it's not of a good report, don't think on it. Turn it to Jesus. In other words, if it doesn't line up with the word, dismiss it. Keeps returning, keep dismissing it. Keep submitting to Christ. Learn to respond to every temptation by stopping it at the door. Because if it gets past the door, you're buying that vacuum. <laughs> All right? You're buying into it. You're, you know, if it gets past, you're going to do it, you know? If it passes the Philippians 4, 8 test, then... Let your mind dwell on the things that are above. Set your mind on things above. Put on the mind of Christ. Put on your helmet of salvation. Practice these things. The Bible says, and the God of peace shall be with you. Listen, I know that there's times that people get caught, and I had a man tell me today, you should be praying me, Pastor. I'm, I'm stuck in a place where it's just confess and confess, and I, I repent and confess it, and then repent and confess it again, because I sin, it's sin, confess, sin, confess. It's like a cycle. And I'm trying. Listen carefully. Sheer willpower will not defeat the devil. We shared a scripture last week, resist the devil. Catch what the scripture says in James. When it says resist the devil, he'll flee from you. First of all, it says submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. And too many people, they forget the first part. Submit to God. Submit to God. And then do what? Then you can resist the devil. Now you're not doing it out of your own energy. Now you're not doing it from your own strength. Now you're drawing upon the wealth of grace and glory and power that is in you by virtue of the fact that you belong to Christ and he lives in you. Submit to God and resist the devil. So let's try that together. Submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. So before I resist and before Satan flees, I have to do something. What is it? Submit to God. Say it again. Submit to God. It is right to confess our sins when we fail. I love 1 John 1 9. I can't tell how many times I practice 1 John 1 9. That if we sin, if we fail God, then we confess our sins and praise God that He's faithful and He's just and forgives us from all my sins and washes me clean and righteous before Him. I'm made clean before Him. It's like I'd never sinned it. I'm right with God because He paid the price on the cross for my sin. That, that, that's a great passage, is it not? You know, if you read 1 John, it's broken down about four chapters or so. And remember these Bible chapters and stuff, they just take away the numbers and the, and the, and the chapter divisions because it's a letter, right? It's a letter. And he's saying, listen, you know, if you don't think you've sinned, he said, then you're lying. You're deceiving yourself. He says, if you say that you're walking in the light and you're still living in, with all those things in your life, he said, you're lying. He said, you do not the truth. In other words, you not only tell a lie, you live a lie. He said, but hey, if we'll confess our sins, you know, we we'll own up to the fact, we talked about that last week, confession means, and we confess our sins, and God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us, you know. Forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But he goes on down to make it very clear. He said, my little children, I'm writing you things, these things, so that you don't live in sin. And if in any one of you sins, remember, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So after he's talking about confessing their sin, he says, get your eyes on your advocate. He's the righteous one. That's where your life is. Learn to live dependent upon him. Learn to live committed to him. And learn to live with the confidence that he'll do what he said he would do. He's faithful to bring about in you those things he promised he would bring. Break that old dead cycle. You say, I, I just keep, what's going to keep me going back this afternoon? I'll tell you what's going to keep you. You're going to submit to God. You're going to bring God into the equation because you can't do it without him. Let's stand with our heads bowed.
after this, after they get through, and then we'll uh, allow them to, to finish. Good morning. It is a, a privilege and just an honor to be able to come up here this morning and baptize three more kids this morning. If you too would like to be a part of, of the children's ministry and, and get to lead more children to Christ, let me know. We have a need for additional help Sunday mornings. So if you could just, you know, come on up, let me know. Jesus calls us all to ministry. So if you need to get plugged in somewhere, children's ministry is a great place. This morning, first we have Alan Knapp coming down. Alan actually gave his heart to Christ some time ago, but he never came down for baptism for many reasons that you and I wouldn't, whether it be nerves, fear, not really understanding the need and the purpose of baptism. But uh, you know, to, to see a, a young boy like Alan come forward, hopefully that speaks to more of us. So, Alan, have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Okay. You ready? And then, Alan, I baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and next, we have Ethan Duharte. If you know Ethan even a little bit, you can understand why I say I'm relieved that he didn't cannonball into this water. I would have. So Ethan, you can also understand why I say that his uncontrollable amount of energy can be hard to work with sometimes. But a few Wednesdays ago, God just kind of quieted him and opened his heart. And just to see the, the tears streaming out of his eyes and, and his visual upsetness. You know, he, I asked him what was wrong, and, and he, said, he said, am I going to get to go to heaven? See, e Ethan, like a lot of us, thought that you had to be good enough. Or you had to work really hard to get into heaven. And so we talked about Jesus Christ and the, the purpose of needing a Savior. And we talked about salvation and just to see his excitement that even he could get to go to heaven. And that's what it's all about. So, Ethan, have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. Okay. Get ready. You're not going to baptize yourself. <laughs> so, Ethan, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So last but certainly not least, we have Morgan Bonds coming down. And she's going to be baptized this morning by Lenny Zahn. So Lenny Zahn's going to come down. Well, hi, everybody. And what a joy it is for me uh, to be a part of what's taking place here this morning as we celebrate the children of our church and their profession of Christ in their lives. And so it's my, it's my pleasure this morning uh, to baptize uh, Morgan Bonds, who in uh, camp this year has given her life to Christ. And Morgan wants to say something. One week ago, I went to kids camp. I learned that I could be a Christian someday. On the last night, which was Tuesday, Miss Tammy and Miss Melissa Lowry led me to Christ. I now feel like I'm a part of God. Amen. So Morgan, in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We get, look forward every Sunday to have these baptisms.